Excellent. Okay. I think we're all we're all here. This is great. Okay. So um how many of you like to watch or have attended a race car event? Any kind of race car event. Okay. All right. So NASCAR probably uh for some of you, right? Or there's there's a isn't there a track here in Iowa that has like a, a big event, right? Boone International Speedway. They hold uh super nationals there every year. Okay, excellent. All right. Have any of you ever been to the Indianapolis uh raceway at all? Indiana or the Indianapolis five hundred? Okay. So Indianapolis five hundred is a race here in the United States. It's called open wheel racing. It is very similar to the kind of the granddaddy of all racing, which is called F1, Formula One racing, which is an international racing circuit. The top racing in the whole world is F1. So uh, because none of you are probably well educated about F1, I thought today showing and talking about F1 in the context of ethics, business ethics, and just ethics in general is going to be a fun exercise. So um, what I'm going to ask from you, and I'll throw an assignment up there, is you are going to have to write down, you're going to have to write down a couple of things while you're watching these, okay, so that make sure you're not disengaged at all. I'm going to need you to identify from the video we watch here together. We're going to talk about it too, so... If you're having a hard time keeping up with it, you can also listen to people's comments at the end, and this might also help you come up with some answers for this. But you're going to submit on Canvas um, at least one major ethical dilemma or issue. It, now, it could be that it's a real issue, or it could be an accusation of an issue. So you might disagree and say, oh, there's no issue. But you have to identify at least what's the accusation of the ethical issue, even if you don't agree or disagree. And then you have to say, why do you think it's an ethical issue or why do you not think? Why do you think it's not an accurate accusation? So you're thinking ethically about this. So we're using the context of Formula One racing sports because it's a, it's a very interesting and because it's foreign to all of us, it's a great illustration. The second so the first question is, what's the ethical issue that you've identified or the accusation? Why or why not do you agree with it? So, you know, it's got to be maybe two sentences for that. And then the second question will be, even though you can't know the motives, all right, what would you guess are some of the underlying issues that create ethical accusations or ethical issues like this? So... You're kind of saying, this is what either others are saying it is, or this is what I think it is. And then what's the cause of it? Or what would you think would be the cause that would lead to something like this? Okay. Then the last question. So what's the issue and why? What's the cause in your opinion? You don't know people's motives. You can't read their minds. You don't know their hearts. It's a short video, so you can't tell totally. But the third question is, there's a character in this story named Alonzo. That's his last name. What would you do if you were Alonzo in this situation? So it's kind of a three question. The first question is kind of a two part, like, because you're not only identifying it, but you're saying why. It's going to be a couple sentences. You'll submit it on Canvas. We're going to discuss it at the end. So you might get some good tips from your classmates. Everyone good with that? So before we get into talking about the issue, I want to get us all educated on Formula One racing, okay? So these are the fastest. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily the fastest cars. They're the fastest on these kind of tracks. So there's other kinds of racing that's also extremely fast. But uh, I want to educate you at least a little bit on um, Formula One racing before we get into this, just so you understand kind of what's at stake here. So let me pull up. Formula One. Can you guys see my shared screen YouTube page coming up? Yes? Okay. All right. Hopefully, you'll also be able to. Can you do that? that is the world champion 
Thrilling, glamorous and fast. Formula One is the world's most exciting sport with 500 million fans all focusing on the 20 drivers and 10 teams vying for the glory of winning the world championship. The action as soon as we approach the milestone 1000 in China is as breathtaking as it's ever been. Rookies taking on the establishment with unpredictable results of drama both on track and off. Silverstone 1950 at the British Grand Prix ignited the world's passion for the new Formula One World Championship. Giuseppe Farina, the sport's first race winner and world champion. But his reign was short-lived, with Juan Manuel Fangio flat out towards greatness with five of the next seven titles for four different marks. The maestro wheel-to-wheel -wheel with Ferrari's inaugural star Alberto Ascari. The competition intensified at the end of the 1950s with the rise of British privateers like Cooper, Lotus and BRM. F1's golden era, a no-holds-barred dogfight in fast but dangerously fragile cars. For countless lost heroes and world titles from legendary drivers like Graham Hill, Jim Clark and Sir Jack Brabham, his last of three in 1966, won in a car bearing his own name, a feat yet to be repeated. The prancing horse also galloped on to the delight of the Tifosi, creating giants of the sport like John Surtees, the only man to win world titles on both two and four wheels. It was also a time of great change, as championed by Sir Jackie Stewart, who dominated on track and lobbied tirelessly for safety off it. The clash of titans continued into the 70s with iconic races, including a charismatic Brazilian Emerson Fittipaldi at the front of the grid, Emo twice lifting the crown with Lotus and McLaren. The squad's next big star, British playboy James Hunt, I haven't done my hair yet. I'm not ready to go on the telly. who fought tooth and nail with straight-talking Austrian Nicky Lauda. Both becoming world champions, Lauda incredibly recovered from a potentially fatal crash to go on and secure two more world titles. The path to the 80s saw another spike in British team success with some explosive rivalries along the way. At Williams, between Nelson Piquet and Nigel Mansell. I mean, the crowd won the race for me as much as I won the race. They were just truly fantastic. The most intense of all at McLaren between Alain Prost and Ed Senna. Oh my goodness, this is fantastic! It becomes absolutely impossible to work with Seattle. I think everyone knows Prost by now. The incredible, irrepressible Brazilian, sadly gone before his time. But not before the rise of another superstar, Michael Schumacher, who became a new benchmark. His record seven world titles at Benetton and Ferrari earned against the best at Williams and McLaren. Oh, oh, oh. Schumacher's reign was eventually ended by another ascending legend, Fernando Alonso. The pair nose to tail in 2006, the baton passing. To become champion when Michael still on the track has maybe more value. Oh my goodness me! Again. The following season saw not only the debut of Lewis Hamilton, but also Sebastian Vettel. I love you guys. I love you. Both going on to create history in the most astonishing ways, with other fairy tale results in between. It's, just, uh, it's an incredible, an incredible feeling. Yeah, a very humbling experience. And with new blood flooding into the sport each year, the furious chase for the holy grail of motorsport continues, ensuring a thrilling spectacle as the world's most exciting sport rumbles on. 1,000 races in the making. From race one to 1,000, Formula One cars have become state-of-the-art prototypes, sculpted beasts with road-relevant power units, capable of racing at up to 360 kilometers per hour. These high-tech machines have transformed out of sight in 70 years. The earliest cars of the 1950s built around steel frames and the engine in front of the driver who sported a cloth cap before helmets. Into the 60s, and iconic designers like Lotus boss Colin Chapman worked on rigidity using tubular space frame chassis with engines bolted to the rear for better handling. Wings front and rear soon arrived. 
The Quantum Leap came in the 1980s in McLaren's MP41 that featured a strong carbon fiber turbo monocoque, creating a survival cell for the driver. Aerodynamics and supercomputers soon began to dictate design, with F1's turbo hybrid era beginning in 2014. In the modern age, Formula One is a global phenomenon, with the world's finest racing drivers going wheel to wheel at breathtaking speeds, each pulling up to 5G in corners and under braking. It's a mouth-watering proposition for fans who watch from March through to December as the sport flies around the world to 21 destination races, including iconic classic tracks like Monaco, Spa, Monza, Suzuka and Silverstone. And more recent hits like Azerbaijan, Russia, Mexico, F1's original night race in Singapore and the futuristic season finale in Abu Dhabi. The excitement skyrockets as the teams touch down in a new location. The cameras flash as the stars of the show prepare for battle, all putting it on the line in pursuit of that rare coveted prize, the power, the prestige and glory of the Formula One World Championship. All right, let me uh, stop this here. Okay, so that I just wanted to give you a quick... For those of you who maybe have never watched a single moment of Formula One racing, just to give you kind of the level, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Some of the teams spend half a billion dollars a year to race in these 21 races. It is unbelievable the amount of money in Formula One, and that's going to play into this. Plus, some of the names, I want you to at least hear a couple of the names pop up in that review video before we get into this story. So this is the story of a of what is called Formula One's darkest moment. It is a scandal that still has never been totally uh, taken apart. I mean, there's a lot of theories and there have been some cases and things like that. But this is the one I need you to uh, write down. Ethical issue, why or why not? Um, what's the root cause or motive, and then what would you do if you were Alonzo, who was in that video, just a little bit. So you're going to see a couple different characters that you saw in that video as it flew through. So everyone good? Everyone can hear okay, right? Good? Okay. All right, here we go. Affectionately named Crashgate. The events that follow in the story cover the Singapore Grand Prix from the 2008 season, and they're centered around Fernando Alonso, two-time world champion, Renault Formula One team, and Nelson Piquet Jr., who hails from Formula One royalty, the son of Nelson Piquet Sr., three times over the world champion of the Formula One series. On the Renault Formula One side, we'll be talking, of course, about the managing director at the time, Flavio Briatore, and executive director of engineering, Pat Simmons. There are two sides to the story, just like with every tale, what it looks like and what's beneath the surface. In order to tell this story properly, we have to do it in three different parts. Act 1, the fall from grace. Act 2, the crash. Act 3, damage control. Act 1, the fall from grace. Despite having the blood of one of the greatest Formula 1 champions we've ever seen running through his veins, Nelson Piquet Jr. was just a rookie. And on that day, the 15th round of the Formula 1 season in 2008, the first night race that we've ever had in Formula 1 history, Nelson Piquet Jr. just made another rookie mistake, going into the wall at turn 17 on lap 14 of the 2008 Grand Prix in Singapore. On a more aggressive strategy, two-time world champion Fernando Alonso was already into the pits by the time Piquet had made his wreck and a lengthy safety car emerged. Alonso took advantage of the fact that other teams were in the pits and had clean air in front of him. He took the lead because of this, held onto the lead and took Renault's first win of that season in his first in about a year. And this race didn't put him in the hunt for the Formula 1 championship. It barely put the team in the hunt for one of the best constructors on So over a decade later, why are we still talking about this race? We start with understanding the players to this story. So let's start with a familiar face, Fernando Alonso. Alonso, having been in Formula 1 since 2001, had been driving for Renault Formula 1 team for five years since 2002. Highly regarded as one of the best drivers in history to squeeze every point in the maximum out of the car. With Fernando Alonso behind the wheel of the car, the Renault Formula 1 team saw massive success. This was particularly true in the 2005 and 2006 season where he became double world champion. Fernando Alonso went to McLaren for the 2007 season where he was partnered next to Lewis Hamilton, who had one of the greatest rookie seasons we've ever seen in Formula 1 history. 
missing out on the championship by a single point by most standards would be pretty successful, gutting, but successful. But when you do it next to a rookie, when technically you lose on countback to a rookie, on paper, this was not Fernando Alonso's most impressive result. The Renault R27 did not produce the same results as its recent predecessors. Aerodynamics was the key focus for the R27 and the major differences between that and the successful R26. Fresh off championship winning form, the R27 failed to even win a single Grand Prix. In fact, the R27 only took one podium at the Japanese Grand Prix in 2007 by the rookie Kovalainen. Having failed to win a single Grand Prix, Renault needed to change something. The plan was pretty simple. Get Alonso back and pair him next to the 2007 reserve driver at the time, Nelson Piquet Jr. That season wasn't really the return to glory the Renault team had actually hoped for. Entering the 15th race of that season, the Singapore Grand Prix, the duo of Renault were comfortably behind on points and pace. Following the conclusion of the Italian Grand Prix, Renault was deadlocked with Toyota at 41 points in the Constructors' Championship. The BMW Sauber team was a distant way off at 117 points with neither PK nor Alonso being within the top five of the Drivers' Championship at the time. While it was able to string together strong performances, starting with the Singapore Grand Prix, he could end up splitting the Sauber duo of Robert Kubica and Nick Hadfield for fifth place. All right, let me just interject here because I know there's a lot of names and a lot of terminology. So when they say a podium, they're talking about someone coming in first, second, or third. Hence, they stand on the podium after the race. Okay, so, and then every team, there are 10 teams. Each team has two drivers that race. So there's 20 drivers total, two from each team. And the teams all have different names, Renault, BMW, Mercedes, whatever. So Renault is a French team that Fernando Alonso drives for. Is that everyone caught up on that? Okay, all right, here we go. And it's all based on points, not just how many times they win, but let's say you come in third five times and first one time, you might have more points than someone that came in first twice, but never was on the podium the rest of the time. So at the end of the season, it's not just based on each Grand Prix, which is a individual race, but the championship is based on your total points collected over the whole year. So whoever has the most points, they win the championship. And then the team that builds the car, they get points also, and they have what's called the constructor championship. Basically, so the team, the car can win, and all the team that works on the car, and then also the driver can win for the whole season, or the driver can win just one race. So you can win individual races, all that's added up at the end to see who's the champion, and then also which team is the constructor champion. All right, back at it. Nice. With the background, the implications, and the importance of this Grand Prix set, we go into the next act. Act 2. The Crash. We begin this act on September 26, 2008. Team Alonso actually running well all weekend long, and even ending the final two practice sessions in first place. The following day in the qualifying session, Fernando Alonso continues his strong run, and it looks like he could actually land on the third row of the grid for the start of the race. But unfortunately, Alonso failed to progress further than Q2 in the qualifying session due to a mechanical failure in his R28. Accordingly, Alonso was relegated to the back of the grid in 15th place. The grid is just the starting order. They start in two rows of 10. The front of the grid is what's called pole position and number two, and it works all the way back. And because he did something, he broke some rule, they put him in the very back. So he has to start way back in the back basically like starting in the back of a pack for a race it's going to be very hard for him to win the race if he's all the way in the back so that's that's when when they're talking about the grid it's next to his teammate nelson pk in 16th and while an aggressive strategy at singapore makes sense if you're him, not necessarily from 15th place but here's where the controversy really begins because alonso went with a strategy that was at best unconventional and at worst it was suspicious Alonso opted for a two-stop strategy starting in 15th place, fueling up on a first stint of only 12 laps. If he was lucky, he had enough fuel to maybe make it to about 14 laps. For those of you who've never watched racing, a race is sometimes hundreds of miles, but the gas tank on a race car is not big enough to hold enough fuel to race the whole race. So you have to take at least one stop, sometimes two stops, to change out your tires because they get worn out and also to get more fuel or fix any damage that's happened to your car. That's called a pit stop, or they also call it pulling into the box, but it's basically coming in for a pit stop. 
and every team has to have a different strategy. Some teams will try and use all their gas and hopefully cross the finish line on fumes while other teams will play it safe, come in. It's only three seconds to refill. These guys are super fast, but by the time you get back on the track, it could be 15 seconds, and that could mean the difference between you winning or losing. So uh, first off, if you're towards the back of the pack, to stop is almost guaranteeing you're going to stay in the back of the pack. But also, uh, to stop twice is really unusual. Um, usually you don't do that unless you just absolutely have to. So here we go. At the time and after the race, it was expressed that the team didn't really feel that the circuit was actually capable of making enough overtakes to go on a one-stop strategy. The technical engineers also concluded that the brakes weren't strong enough to be able to take a one-stop strategy. Just two laps later, after Alonso's early pit stop, PK Jr. went into the wall at turn 17. It's worth noting that at this point on the circuit, turn 17 is a very difficult place to remove and recover. Both Rosberg and Kibitza had planned to pit pretty early, but not that early. Both of them were forced to go in despite a safety car coming out to remove PK Jr.'s car. This meant that they were both going to serve 10 second drive through penalties. So when there's an accident on the track, they slow down the race. A car that's not a race car pulls out onto the track and no one can pass that car. You're stuck in the position you're in. So sometimes teams will go ahead and take their pit stop break during that lap while that safety car is driving around slowing everyone down because it's a logical time to go ahead and get gas or to get your tires changed. But if it wasn't part of your strategy, you're not supposed to use a pit stop to your advantage. And so they penalize you uh, a penalty for taking advantage of that because it's like taking advantage of someone else's accident. So the safety car drives around, forcing everyone to slow down. It gives a lot of time for them to clean up. These tracks are not just a big oval either. They sometimes have 15, 20 turns on them. And so when they're talking about there's not enough opportunity for overtakes, there's almost no place to pass anyone. The track is narrow, a lot of turns, really hard to pass people. So that's why they're saying it's really unusual. He started way back in the back. It's almost impossible to pass enough people on such a windy track to ever get to the front. And so that's why they're saying there's something suspicious here because he took an early pit stop, which he didn't need to do. And then he was taking this very aggressive strategy. And then all of a sudden his partner crashes and uh, he's already taken his pit stop. And this was the only rule that allowed cars to go into pit lane under a safety car. Other than running out of fuel, you have to wait until the pit lane is open. Sorry. One of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right. But there we go. Open. This rule plays to counteract the fact that if there was a safety car, whoever could get to the pit to refuel first, well, they would actually come out better than any other driver. And you had to line up behind the safety car until pit lane opened. Once pit lane opened at the Singapore Grand Prix, basically every single car who needed to pit, pit to refuel. Alonso took advantage of this and in a big way. The perfect timing of the pit stop allowed him to run in clean air and make up many positions in those crucial laps. The only other cars that were actually able to pit before the safety car was deployed were the two Red Bulls and one Honda. Meanwhile, in pit lane, Ferrari and Felipe Massa encountered a pit stop nightmare where he left with the fuel hose still attached. He was forced to drive to the end of pit lane before his team were actually able to make it to him and remove the fuel hose, but it was too late. His race was essentially over. Meanwhile, Nico Rosberg was forced to serve his drive through penalty along with Robert Kubica, and after the penalties and a couple other mechanical failures, Alonso inherited the lead. Alonso took the checker flag for the first time in over a year and gave Renault their first win that season. The podium was completed by Nico Rosberg in second place and Lewis Hamilton taking six points in third place. At the time, the grid mostly just moved on. We kept racing and the Formula 1 season came to a close relatively quietly. It wasn't until the 2009 season that we saw things spring back up from that fateful day at the Singapore Grand Prix in 2008. And it was all kicked off by Nelson Piquet Jr. being dropped by the Renault Formula 1 team. Act 3. Damage Control. Lewis Hamilton ended up winning the Drivers' Championship by a single point, denying Felipe Massa his world title. And due to the fact that, indirectly at least, Felipe Massa felt that that wreck at the Singapore Grand Prix cost him the driver's title, he raised some questions about the incident. But at the time, Max Mosley, who was the FIA president, dismissed them. They didn't really have the incident, it was simply speculation. 
Thus, the 2009 season commenced, but not very well for Nelson P.K. Jr., who never even scored a point. Being on a single-year contract doesn't speak volumes about a team's belief in your ability to perform, but getting a single point would have helped. Meanwhile, Alonzo, not necessarily turning heads with his results, but Alonzo, he did have 13 points by the 10th race of the season, which is where the Renault team actually dropped Nelson P.K. and decided to bring on Roman Grosjean of all people. Here's where things get really interesting, so we're going to do this in a timeline fashion. Confirmed through the testimony, we can look at all this pretty specifically, and we know that P.K. was fired on July 26, 2009 less than a week after being fired from his Renault drive. Nelson Piquet goes to the FIA to report the incidents from the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. He claimed that Simmons and Briatore directly were asking him to crash on the 14th lap in order to give Alonso the edge. The events that played out at the Singapore Grand Prix in 2008 were exactly as they engineered and planned, and planned it was down to the very turn that they wrecked knowing that the safety car would have to be deployed and it would be pretty lengthy. Alonso would use this time in order to separate himself and take maximum points, which played out perfect. And just about a month after he made the initial claims, Brazilian TV came out with a story that said that PK Jr. was ordered to crash at the Singapore Grand Prix. This forced the FIA into action of some sort, saying they were investigating quote-unquote alleged incidents at a Grand Prix previous in the F1 calendar. They didn't actually say what Grand Prix this was. But it was pretty clear, at least to those questioning Renault's return to their winning form in Formula 1. And after a swift investigation following the announcement from Brazil TV, on September 4th, 2009, the FAA had concluded and officially accused Renault of conspiring with Nelson Piquet to fix the Singapore Grand Prix from the 2008 Formula 1 season. The governing body wanted to hold an official hearing into the matter and decided to host a meeting at the FAA World Motorsport Council. This was to occur just days shy of the one-year anniversary from Crashgate. Before they could even arrive at the council hearing in Paris on the 21st, PK gave his second public statement about the incident, while simultaneously it turns out that his first statement somehow was leaked to the press. The residing FIA president at the time, Max Mosley, was forced to respond. In doing so, he was able to confirm that, quote, I haven't seen anything which I believe to be a forgery. In the sworn statements, it's clear that P.K. is implicating both Briatore and Pat Simmons of Renault. It's worth pointing out though, he doesn't directly implicate Fernando Alonso for knowing about the strategy, merely benefiting from it. Although his implication about the fact that he probably should have questioned the overly aggressive strategy was duly noted. Also included that following day after the leak is exposed, Max Mosley is forced to admit the fact that he had offered Pat Simmons immunity for time in giving information about the incident. And the drama persisted as inside that same week, Renault counters with their own criminal charge, saying that they would be pursuing criminal action against PK and PK Sr., quote, concerning the making of false allegations and a related attempt to blackmail the team into allowing Mr. PK Jr. to drive for the remainder of the 2009 season. Immediately following the press release, details surfaced about the fact that Pat Simmons had just blown the case wide open. It was reported that he had spoken to FIA investigators and told them the fact that Nelson P.K. was the one who initiated the idea of crashing in the turn 17. So, in a way, it was 100% off the table by the middle of September that Renault was just not involved. That was out of the question. They were involved in some way, we knew for sure. And on the 15th of September, we see the Times newspaper actually publish records of the radio transmissions they had gotten a copy of. Not even a single day had gone by after the Times published that report issued this statement. The ING Renault F1 team will not discuss allegations made by the FIA concerning the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. It also wishes to state that its managing director, Flavio Briatore, and its executive director of engineering, Pat Simmons, have left the team. Mind you, just five days earlier, on September 11th, they announced that they would be pursuing criminal charges against the PKs. And at this point, it's pretty clear that Simmons, at least, is admitting something happened and that he was involved in some way. Briatore, on the other hand, is persistent that he had no hand in the matter and that he only resigned to protect the team. Despite the fact that Renault had actually come out and said they would not dispute the charges, that September 21st, 2009 meeting at the World Motorsports Council in Paris went ahead as scheduled. It essentially amounted to a sentencing hearing. The council decided that the most appropriate course of action to punish the team would be to disqualify Renault Formula One, suspended two years. As long as they stayed out of trouble and did not repeat any of these egregious offenses, then they would have two years. It essentially was probation. Simmons, on the other hand, was banned for a total of five years, and it's likely that he avoided indefinite banning from the sport due to his cooperation. 
Flavio Briatore is maintaining of his own innocence, despite the overwhelming evidence that was cutting against his claims, is ultimately what got him indefinitely banned from FIA-sanctioned activity. As for Fernando Alonso, he was absolved and cleared of any sort of involvement in the matter. At the time, the FIA were still recovering from a couple other major controversies, and it's thought that Briatore is made an example of. He announced that he would be challenging the FAA decision just a month after the FAA had passed down the ruling to essentially de facto ban him for life. Briatore in early January actually ended up winning that claim, and he was awarded 15000 in compensation. Less than a week later, the FAA announced that they would be mounting an appeal of their own. And to avoid an ongoing legal battle, the FAA announced in early April that they had made a settlement with both Simmons and Briatore and that this issue was put to bed and over and no more legal action would be pursued by either side. Additionally, the FAA compromised and said that both Briatore and Simmons would have to wait until 2013 before they could work in Formula One. One of the more confusing outcomes of the Crashgate incident was the decision to let Alonso keep his points from that race despite the fact that it was engineered. Now, many will fairly argue that it was early on in the race, despite being engineered, Alonso technically didn't inherit first place after that crash. Coupled with the many other incidents Fernando Alonso may not be at the center of, but he is just off camera, just off screen, and to some people where there's smoke, there's fire. Hey, are you tired of suffering? Are you tired of waking up every day already exhausted, barely able to get your feet? But I don't need the commercial. There we go. Almost done here, folks. This episode of F1 Wars was one of my favorite because it does a bunch of things all in one. One of the things that I wish we knew more about any controversy period was what happened after. How did things actually develop? You know, you see the one big thing and that's it. But with Crashgate, everything was playing out basically live. The other thing that I love about the story is it makes a driver human. So often we see these, you know, our favorite Formula One drivers and we see them as almost like godlike. They're absolutely blessed athletes with unbelievable instinct, but they're still people. And, you know, for the first time we see a driver fail and what they're willing to do to undo that error, that mistake, to secure their seat and their future. What lengths are they willing to go to? And behind every major controversy is a desperate human and sometimes the driver's involved. One thing I'd like to know in the comment section below, was Alonso involved? Did he know? How could a double world champion not question that kind of strategy to go out on, you know, on 12 laps to expect that low of a fuel load when you're stuck in the grid? That doesn't make any sense, right? Whether you think Alonso knew or, or didn't know, it's, I'll leave that to the comment section. But the fact remains is that it happened and it's probably going to happen and always going to happen because all these things are driven by people. We all have flaws. But hopefully the F1 Wars episode and all these, this whole series sheds lights on all these incidents so that we can better understand and hopefully adapt in the future. But who are we kidding? So thanks for checking this out, guys. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to see you. All right. Let me uh, get rid of this here real quick. Pause it here. Okay. All right. So quick review. Obviously, there's a lot to that. A lot of italian and spanish names and terminology you might not be familiar with but in that race the teammate nelson pk jr his father is like royalty in racing because he won three times he was champion three times i believe wrecked his car and the accusation was that he wrecked it on purpose they were able to prove that he did indeed wreck his car on purpose which did give his partner, his teammate, Alonzo, an advantage. So those are all true. What they, what they have not divulged is who told Nelson PK Jr. to wreck his car. And it did affect the outcome of the race, including Alonzo coming in uh, first place in that race. So he got points from that race. But... Uh, the FIA, the governing body, allowed him to keep his points. So kind of collect your thoughts here. I want to talk a little bit about um, the ethical aspects of this in this last 10 minutes. Uh, was there an ethical dilemma or ethical issue? Why or why not? Uh, without knowing the motives, what would be the root cause of an issue like this? And then if you were Alonzo, what would you do? Okay. So... Let's start off with the ethical dilemma or issue. Anyone want to throw out there what they think uh, at least one of the ethical dilemmas or ethical issues? And you might have to identify which party in the story 
is at the center of the the issue that you're identifying because there could be multiple depending on which party you're focusing on just unmute yourself and jump in uh, i think one thing that would involve a lot of consideration would be uh the i forget what the governing body the fia i think it's called um at the end of it they let him keep his points i think that'd be something that is kind of something that needs a lot of discussion because whether the racer was involved or not, as I said, it still was engineered. And so it still kind of was an artificial victory, even if he wasn't a part of the planning. And so that would be something that, that would be a dilemma, whether they should allow him to keep his points, whether he was a part of it or not. Yep. Yeah. Good. What else? I'd say one of the biggest problems is um, Renault just risking the life and health of one of their racers just to get a win, which is really unethical. <laughs> yeah. If you, I mean, it went by so quick, but where PK Jr. wrecked his car, I think it's turn 17, it's like a blind corner. So other cars are coming around that corner at 150 miles an hour, faster than you've ever seen a car go on a highway, twice as fast as anything you've ever seen on a highway, coming around the corner that fast on slick tires, and then there's this car right in the middle of the road, and he's got to climb out of his car, run across the track, jump the wall, um, and, you know, someone could come up in a split second. And so, yeah, that's an issue. I hadn't thought about that one, Joe, but that's very good. What else? I'd have to wonder... Uh, how um, how aware his teammate was for the um, the intent of his teammate because honestly uh, given that I given that um, my teammate was not aware of uh, the upcoming accident um, but yet it happens. Um, I think I, I would kind of, if I had no idea that that was going to happen, I don't see why I would choose to lose. I would take advantage of that just because that's all I know about. So, I mean, that would be a very hard decision to make because you would be making a lot of assumptions, uh, a lot of negative assumptions about your own teammate. And given that, depending on how, how familiar you are with his, his choices, um, I don't know. It, it don't, I don't know that it really noticed or uh, said anything about that, about whether he was aware of that. Um, uh, but um, other than the fact that he, um, uh, I think it was round 12 instead of 14 that could have been, you know, could have flipped those, but, um, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell, but, um, unless you assume that he was obviously planning on this, but I mean, yeah, it's a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Well, and so um, in other sports, teammates help each other win, right? So even in NASCAR, I believe, they'll work together, right? So they'll kind of box out and they'll they'll kind of protect each other. And they might even decide ahead of time, hey, if we're at the front, this guy's going to be number one and this guy's going to be number two. And they'll – or this – you know, there's lady NASCAR drivers too. So these two drivers, one's going to be number one, one's going to be number two for the good of the team. They make those decisions. Something that's different in Formula One, which um, would explain why it went so long before it ever came up. Formula One racers don't work together normally. Most Formula One racers, two drivers for the same team, on eight out of the ten teams, hate each other. And if they have a chance to beat each other, they will every single time. So, matter of fact, that's what uh, different historical racers say. is like, hey, if there's an opportunity to pass someone, I will do it. 
every time. It doesn't matter what's going on. And so that's kind of the mentalities. They don't necessarily normally conspire to win a race together because everyone's actually going for first place. It's not like they're going for first and second place or they want their their um, team to win the Constructors' Championship as, as a car. They want to just win. And their longevity and, and their career and their finances are all directly dependent on their own personal winning. So anyone else want to comment on the ethical aspect? All right, so let me let me ask. Uh, let's get let's get one of the ladies chime in here. So, without knowing the motives, she can't read their minds or know what's in their hearts. What would be the root cause of an ethical failure like this, if it was indeed an ethical failure? What would what would lead to that, or what would be like a root cause that would um, create this kind of scenario? I guess an obvious one would just be the desire to win and to make a profit. Yeah. So like many sports, obviously you have you have competition, but there is so much money involved. I mean, when you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars and a racer, so Nelson PK Jr. in this story, he wasn't even guaranteed to build a race the next year. So for him to be able to endear himself to his team so that he can race for another year, well, that might be his big year. That might be the year he makes $100 million. That might be the year that he goes down the record books like his father. So there's a lot of that uh, desire for financial, but also the desire for competition. What else? What else would any of you think would be a root cause for something that would lead to an ethical issue like this? Noah, what do you think? I think just getting the recognition. Um, this kind of this goes along with um, the desire to win, but just getting recognition from uh, others because um, they were having a bad year, and I guess just that desire to at least win something. Um, I don't really know. I, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, if you're not, I mean, I would never cheat, but if you don't have a chance to get first, why would you, or to win the championship, why would you even care about cheating? I, I yeah. Well, and, and Alonzo, you know, he had won previous championships and then he was having a down year. So even to win one race, I think, was a, you know, for him to have lost everything up to that point was a real blow to his his ego, of course. You know, so we're touching on a lot of common themes that lead to all ethical issues, right? Greed, uh, desire for power and recognition, uh, desire to win at all costs. So the Bible talks about, you know, what are our three things? You know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This relates to depend on who you are in the story you could be any one or all three of those temptations the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life every one of these guys has a huge ego i don't think if you were to google humble f1 driver i don't i don't know if anything will come up i mean there, you you would you'd be hard pressed to find someone so let's wrap it up with someone that has not answered yet if you were alonzo in this situation it all plays out after the fact what would you do what would you do if you were Alonzo in this situation? Realistically, not, you know, I'm not looking for the answer that will get you, you know, a good grade in, in uh, you know, high school Bible class. This is a, in reality, if you were Alonzo, what would you do in this situation? I mean, if I was him and like, we're not doing the whole biblical like what's the right response to have i would just try to lay low and keep the points because if they're not like pointing fingers at you saying you didn't get involved then i would just keep it because that like in their mindset if they just want to win and get to the best position then why would they speak up and give up those points necessarily so yeah what else anyone else have a comment on that So Alonzo was never convicted of anything, right? So he was exonerated. 
of not knowing about any conspiracy. He benefited from Nelson P.K. Jr.'s decision to wreck. But what they determined was he did not win the race only because of that. He also had, still had to drive well. He had to not wreck his own car. He had to pass a few people along the way. So Nelson P.K. Jr.'s decision hurt the other drivers, and it did help uh, uh, Alonzo, but it might not have helped him enough to win without his own talent. There are issues right like this going on right now in American sports. So Major League Baseball, there was a big scandal uh, where before a, a certain pitch, you know, people were banging on trash cans so they knew what pitch was coming, so they knew how to line up and hit. There's been football scandals. There's all kinds of scandals, and they all kind of come from the same place. I was looking up, I was curious if there were any Christian F1 drivers. There's a couple Catholics. Carlos Sanz Jr. is a, is a Catholic, and he actually drives for Renault now. But Alonzo, interestingly enough, when I looked up Christian F1 drivers, the first thing comes up, Alonzo, atheist. He, he made a statement in a magazine a couple years ago. He's never believed in God. He doesn't believe he needs anyone else's help. It's all about him out on the track. So you think about his worldview, even if he's a moral atheist, you know, someone that believes in the golden rule, he probably has no reason in the world. What can he do? He can't give the point. There's no way for him to give the points back. There's no vehicle for that. There's no way for him to, um, he could maybe make a public statement. That's that's the only thing I was, I was trying to put myself in his shoes. If I genuinely knew that this was a possible issue, he could possibly make a public statement, you know, but he can't sue to have the points taken away from himself. And he has to be, you know, he's part of a team. And so, you know, if he truly isn't culpable, but other people on the team were punished for their role in it, then maybe he made the right decision. Just be quiet about it and keep driving. And maybe he's innocent. You'll never know. That's that's the thing. So these these things have little, they're, they're, there are shades of this. Um, obviously, as a believer, you want to have the best possible testimony. You would never want to put yourself in that situation. But uh, you would want to identify early on. And like we've talked about other other times, you need a high level of accountability as a Christian leader. So anyway, very interesting topic. And uh, you can go back. I linked, if you go to the playlist for this class on YouTube, on my channel, I have both those videos linked. So if you need to go back and refresh your memory a little bit, um, you can go back and watch those and scan through them. And the, the little review video will make even more sense to you now because some of the characters, you'll go back, watch that. You'll be like, oh, yeah, that's the guy. Oh, yeah, that's his dad. So you'll see that in there as well. So, okay, I will put the assignment on Canvas in the next 15 minutes so you can complete it if you're, like, sitting at your desk and you just want to get it done. Um, Jesse... David, Gonerman, Huang, thank you for joining class today. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. All right, great. I'm just glad I didn't hear snoring coming from your microphone there. So, <laughs> all right. And uh, everyone else, thank you also. We will see you later.